In this review, we'll cover six main factors that backpackers will find useful for a video drone. Automated filming and photo modes, wind tolerance, ability to see the new integrated controller in bright conditions, general image quality, comparisons to the older Mini 2, and low light performance. Image quality. First off, when flying the Mini 3 Pro, I would highly recommend switching from the regular color profile into the cine like You will get a bit more dynamic range and many more options in terms of color grading when working with your footage later on. A quick comparison is shown here on a day with high dynamic range between a GoPro Hero 9, the Mini 3 Pro, and the older Mini 2. All three cameras are shot in 4K with the flattest color profile the camera allows. After normalizing the footage with a color card, I think the footage from the Mini 3 Pro comes out looking a bit better than the GoPro and a lot better than the Mini 2. There is still a fair bit of detail in the shadows without overexposing the highlights. Overall, especially when using the DCNE like color profile, there are significant improvements between the Mini 2 and the Mini 3 Pro. With both, it is good to keep in mind that this footage is coming from a drone that weighs under 250 grams. Next up, comparing the size of these two drones. As you can kind of see, the Mini 3 Pro, despite being the same mass, has a larger wingspan and in general just is a little bit larger in all dimensions compared to the Mini 2. If we were to take these devices and collapse them down to their kind of more portable travel state. You can see that side by side here, the Mini 3 Pro is still a bit larger in terms of dimensions, a bit taller as well. So in terms of ultra packability, the Mini 2 is still ever so slightly smaller, but not that much of a difference. And both of these are still much smaller than other drones in DJI's fleet say the Mavic 2 Air or Mavic 3, which you could stack several of these beside each other to get the same size of those. Active and focus track. Especially in a backpacking context, some of the best filming opportunities are in places where you don't really want to stand still piloting the drone. Unlike the Mini 2, the Mini 3 Pro can track people and objects, either while fixed in place or while moving in front or paralleling them. For successful tracking though, the object should be large in the frame. The next automated shooting mode is a useful one, quick shots. These are preset flight patterns and we have six to choose from. Droney, Helix, Rocket, Circle, Boomerang, and Asteroid. The descriptions are quite self-explanatory and the results are generally quite good. One thing to keep in mind though is that settings from video resolution and exposure will not carry over from regular video. So you should make sure they are set to what you want before you start recording a quick shot. Photo modes. Along with the automated video modes, the Mini 3 Pro has quite functional automated photo modes. The new gimbal design allows for a full 360 by 180 field of view to automatically take wide angle, vertical, or even fully spherical panoramas. Internal photo stitching is usually pretty good, but you can also force the drone to save individual frames and merge them yourself later. For a drone of this size, photo quality is excellent with resolutions up to 48 megapixels, as well as regular JPEG, 
and raw DNG export options. The last of the automated flight modes are hyperlapses. There are four different options to choose from, and I have found the waypoint mode to allow for the most interesting results. In this mode, you fly the drone to specific points and key in camera locations you want to use as keyframes. The drone will then automatically move between these points, smoothly making a time lapse. The speed of the drone depends upon the number of frames you want to record, and as a result, hyperlapses are best done with a full battery to get the longest swath of time. On a related note, specifications claim a flight time of 34 minutes maximum, but in reality, if there is a little bit of wind, you'll probably get a bit less than 30-ish minutes. And want to save a few minutes on the end as a safety buffer to get the drone back to you, just in case. Internal rendering of hyperlapses is decent, but I strongly recommend saving the individual frames and then using separate rendering and stabilization software to get a more visually pleasing result and greater control over color and brightness. A quick aside, like other drones in the Mini lineup, the Mini 3 Pro can be charged directly from a USB-C cable from either a USB power pack or solar panel. This is extremely useful for backpackers compared to some larger drones which may require an AC to DC converter, further adding more weight and more complicated charging methods. Wind resistance is a very important factor to backcountry filming. Many of the most scenic locations, alpine passes, ridge lines, or even near large lakes can often be quite windy. If your drone is going to be tossed around by a gentle breeze, that will severely limit when you can use it and the filming you can do with it. The Mini 3 Pro punches above its weight class, especially in steady moderate to the low end of strong winds. One problem you will see in gusty conditions, however, is the drone has a bit of a hard time counteracting strong to extreme wind gusts. The technical specifications quote a max wind resistance of 10.7 meters per second or 38 kilometers an hour. The Mini 2 came with this rather large controller here which required you to pair the controller itself with a phone in order to operate it. I didn't find that was too big of a bother, but sometimes just having to actually play around with cables to link the, the controller into your phone was a bit of a hassle and an added complexity. The Mini 3 Pro has a few different options. I opted to spend a little more money and get the DJI RC controller. This has a built-in touchscreen display on it, does not require an external phone, connects directly to the device, and generally seems pretty good from what I've used it so far. One key factor which is very important for backpackers is how easy is it to see the controller's built-in screen in different brightness conditions. The controller does allow for a wide range of brightness, and even in the brightest conditions you might expect, at least during the summer, in direct sunlight on a cloudless sky, you can still see enough of the screen to pilot the drone. That being said, I would strongly recommend trying to shade the controller in some fashion, just so you don't have to use that maximum brightness. I can get longer performance out of the internal batteries. Related to image quality, the larger 1 over 1.3 inch sensor and f1.7 aperture allow for the Mini 3 Pro to film in darker conditions without having to crank up the ISO. Keep in mind that many jurisdictions regulate what counts as night flying for drones and can have additional rules when not flying during the day. From my experience, the Mini 3 Pro can get surprisingly nice footage while sticking at ISO 100 around sunrise and sunset and is able to capture nice rosy morning and evening colors. Recommended accessories. There are a few accessories that I would strongly recommend when using the Mini 3 Pro, particularly in a backcountry use context. First off, assuming you have purchased the combo package with the RC controller, it is worthwhile getting an aftermarket harness. Especially if the drone is following you in an automated filming mode, it's quite handy to not have to be holding the controller at all times. 
I haven't tried it yet, but I think that will also be quite useful in the winter for skiing footage. There are many different harnesses to find on the internet, with most retail for about $10 to $15. Secondly, an aftermarket case is a very good idea for the Mini 3 Pro. If you purchased the Flymore Combo, it included a large padded carrying case, but for most people that will be too bulky for backpacking with. A quick browse on the internet can yield a bunch of cases like this one, coming in the $20 to $30 range. Lastly, to get the most visually pleasing footage, it is a good idea to pick up a set of neutral density, or ND filters. If you don't know much about filters, there are different lens covers that diminish the amount of light a camera sensor receives. The general rule is that for realistic looking footage, using a filter that will give you a camera shutter speed of 1 over double the frame rate is ideal. So in this case, if you are shooting 30 frames per second, you should aim for a 1 over 60 seconds shutter speed. For most shooting conditions during the day, I found an ND64 filter works well, or an ND16 in more cloudy conditions. I bought the official DJI ND filter set, which contains ND16, 64, and 256 filters, but I think I will get an expanded set containing a few more lower, ND4 and 8, and mid-range, ND32 and 128 filters in the future. One strange thing to note with the official DJI filter set is that for some reason the stock ND0 camera filter does not fit into the DJI filter case. One would assume they would have built it so it did, but it does not. So plan on some other way to store that ND0 stock filter the DJI filter set retails for about $70, and other filters range higher and lower from there. So I've been using this device, the DJI Mini 3 Pro, for about four months now, on a wide variety of trips, just uh, front country traveling, backpacking, a little bit of scrambling, and I brought this drone along with me, and I've noticed a few very good things about it. A few not so good things, but overall, this is a pretty excellent uh, drone to be carrying in the backcountry. In terms of positives about this drone, first off, it is below 250 grams. That magical threshold where a lot of things become logistically easier. At least in Canada, you don't need a pilot certificate to fly it. You don't have to register it and some of the regulations are a bit less onerous. That being said, do take a look at Transport Canada's website whenever you are watching this video and make sure that what I'm saying is up to date as drone regulations can change quite quickly. Additional benefit of being below 250 grams, as you might expect, it doesn't take up a lot of space in your pack. But a week ago, I just got back from a 13-day backpacking trip where 11 of those days were international parks, you're not allowed to use these contraptions. But I didn't mind carrying it to take advantage of the drone for those last two days. We got some really nice footage. Another big benefit in terms of image quality is a larger sensor as well as wider aperture. This translates into much improved low light performance, so you don't have to crank your ISO as high, so your images will look a little better, a little crisp, less noise. This can be a benefit in a wide variety of shooting conditions, say if you're trying to get sunrise, sunset shots, which on some earlier mini drones could be a little bit tricky. This will perform a lot better. Also on the imaging front, uh, the Mini 3 Pro can also output 10-bit color, which gives you a lot more flexibility of color grading in post-production. If you do not know what those words mean, don't worry about it too much. Translation, it gives you more flexibility to kind of tweak the color profile of your shots after you've taken them, which uh, makes it a bit easier and less stressful when you're in the field. In terms of other positives about this drone, we now have focus track and active track built into the device. This is a huge improvement over the other devices in the Mini series in that, say if you are by yourself on a trip, wandering across a ridge crest, some sort of complicated terrain, the drone itself can use its internal processing power to help you out, either follow behind you, follow beside you, or do a variety of automated shots. 
make it a bit easier and a little less stressful if you are actually traveling in terrain, which is a little more interesting. Another great improvement is the addition of a hyperlapse mode. Myself, I find the term hyperlapse a little bit silly. It's just a time lapse that happens to be flying, but people seem to use it a lot, so that's, that's a different matter entirely. Especially when combined with the longer flight time that the Mini 3 Pro offers compared to previous Mini devices, with the addition of a hyperlapse functionality, there are many opportunities to get some really interesting shots, especially in dynamic lighting, such as sunrise, sunset, or have clouds move by, say if you're setting up a tent or crossing a river or something, a lot of flexibility to get some really interesting shots out of this device. In terms of some things that are less ideal about the Mini 3 Pro, being a small drone, being lightweight, under that 250 gram threshold, it's not gonna have the same sort of wind resistance as a larger drone, say on the DJI fleet, the Mavic 3, or some of their professional cinema drones like the Inspire, something like that, which has a lot more mass to it. So if you are in a really windy environment, you might see the Mini 3 Pro struggling a bit to maintain nice smooth shots, especially while you are moving. That being said, the three axis gimbal is very effective and can compensate for a wide variety of small little motions. But, but basically you have to keep in mind the fact it's 249 grams. It's probably not gonna behave as well in windy conditions as a much heavier professional level drone. Other things that are less ideal in terms of the, the build quality compared to the Mini 2 especially, it just feels much more plastically and fragile I have not had any problems with this particular device having any damage to it while I've been using it, but it just, it feels less durable than the Mini 2 or even just the original DJI Mini. One other problem in warm weather conditions is that this drone can be prone to overheating. If it is just idling in place, not flying through the air, it needs to be moving through the air to cool itself. So if you're in a really warm environment, that could, could be a problem and you might get some overheating warnings. Say if you're just hovering in place and there's no wind. That being said for me, who often fly in cold weather environments, this is actually beneficial. It helps keep the batteries warm. It kind of expands the operating range a little bit. But yeah, who is this drone best for? I'd say basically any sort of self-propelled backcountry traveler who's looking to get some interesting photos or footage. It doesn't take up a lot of weight or space in your pack, gives you surprisingly good image quality, and yeah, if you can afford to buy it, I'd recommend carrying it. Who is this drone not so good for? Basically, if you're a professional videographer as part of an established film shoot, film crew, you're probably going to want something that's a little bit bigger, that gives you more options in terms of camera settings, larger image sensor, more stability in the wind, and overall just more features. That being said, if you would were to carry one of these as a second drone, like a kind of backup situation, that could work quite well. Have something like a Mavic 3 as your primary, this is a secondary, opens up a lot of interesting possibilities for combinations. But yeah, I look forward to keep using this device over the coming winter season, see how it performs in colder weather, on ski touring trips, ski mountaineering, and hope to get some pretty neat footage. Yeah, in any case, that's it for now. Happy trails.